lecture on photosystems experiment that you're going to be doing in lab. And the purpose of our photosystems experiment is to learn how to work with centrifugation, to practice using your pipette, to learn how to use detergents and some basic lab techniques. So we're going to be separating photosystem one from photosystem two in the thylakoid membrane. So if you look at your protocols in your lab manual, the first thing that it tells you is you're going to remove the midribs and petioles from a large amount of spinach and weigh out 50 grams of leaves. So remember in the protein purification lectures, one of the things that I said that you needed to do is you're separating what you want from what you don't want. In this case, when you're working with a spinach leaf, the stems do not have nearly the amount of chlorophyll that the leaves do, so you're gonna be getting rid of the stems. Now it also says remove the midribs. Sometimes there's just, there's just a, a certain pain factor that you just say the heck with it, uh, and removing the stems will be enough. So you're separating the, the spinach leaf from the stems and, and weighing out 50 grams of the washed, dried leaves. Then you're gonna mix it with STN, which is your homogenization buffer. And the STN has three components to it. The STN has sucrose, tris, and sodium chloride. The purpose of sucrose is to give it an isoosmotic uh, solution. You don't want the cells to prematurely burst until you are ready. So you're going to be uh, you're going to be isolating your chloroplasts in an isoosmotic solution after you have broken them free from the whole cells. Uh, you have tris in there because you need a buffer to keep it at pH 7.4. pH 7.4 is physiological pH, and you do this to decrease protease activity. Proteases are slightly more active at acidic pH, so we're keeping it at a slightly alkaline pH to decrease that protease activity in our solutions. We don't want to, we don't want to start chewing up our photosystem 1 or our photosystem 2 due to protease activity before we are able to isolate. Sodium chloride, you need a certain amount of salt in your solution to be able to have your proteins not aggregate. So remember, on the outside of your proteins, you have charged amino acids. You have positively charged amino acids. You have negatively charged amino acids. And if you don't have any salt in the solution, the positive charges are gonna be attracted to the negative charges, and they're gonna aggregate and then precipitate and fall out of solution. So you don't want that to happen. So by having a small amount of sodium chloride in there, we are just preventing aggregation. So basically, after you've added the STN buffer to your, uh, to your spinach leaves, you're going to homogenize them in a wearing blender. This homogenization, the, the blades of the blender are slicing through the, the cells and they're freeing up the chloroplasts so that now the chloroplasts are in solution. You're gonna have some whole cells in there also. You're actually going to be filtering it through uh, mirror cloth, which is like a muslin treated with EDTA. EDTA is ethylene uh, diamine tetraacetic acid. So basically, it's, it's an organic compound that has four tetraacetic acid, four acetic acid compounds, sort of like sticking out, and those acetic acid uh, negatively charged moieties are going to sequester divalent cations. And divalent cations are something that proteases need to have activity. So removing the divalent cations through the use of EDTA as it filters through our mirror cloth means that we're gonna, again, be reducing protease activity. So we're homogenizing it, we're filtering it through mirror cloth in a little, uh, in a little funnel, and we're gonna just sort of squeeze our, our mirror cloth to increase our yield. Uh, not too hard, you don't, wanna, you don't wanna break it open and have all your 
plant, you know, fibrous material falling down into your into your bottle of solution, but then we're going to centrifuge it. Now, actually, the the protocol tells you to put it into SS34 tubes. We're just going to be because we have multiple people doing this at the same time. Um, we're going to be putting it into single GSA bottles. And in the in the video of the experiment, you will see what a GSA bottle looks like. So each group will have one GSA bottle, and then you will be centrifuging it for. Uh, for seven minutes at 3300 RPM. So you're going to be doing a total of three centrifugations, and this is differential centrifugation that you are going to be doing, and there's a reason for doing each of the three spins of differential centrifugation. So the first spin, as I said, is 3300 RPM for seven minutes, and in this first spin, you're going to be separating the whole cells and the chloroplasts from anything smaller. So remember in differential centrifugation, depending on the, the total combination of time and how much force you have in there, that determines what size pieces are, are going to be pelleting against the side of the tube. So in this case, we're spinning with just enough time and just enough force that uh, anything are chloroplasts and anything larger than a chloroplast, including whole cells and dirt particles and things like that, are going to be pelleting in the tube. Anything smaller, any organelles that are smaller, or if an organelle happens to have prematurely burst, for example, due to the wearing blender accidentally slicing through the chloroplast instead of just the whole cell, um, anything smaller than a chloroplast will remain in the supernatant of the solution. So then you're going to take your chloroplasts and anything larger, and you're going to uh, resuspend them in two mils of your STN buffer, and uh, I'm sorry, 35 mils of your STN buffer, and then you're going to spin at 1600 RPM for one minute. So you're resuspending it in a small amount of STN buffer, um, and just spinning just a very, very short time. Now spinning that very, very short time, less time, less speed, means you're going to be separating your whole cells and dirt from chloroplasts. So your chloroplasts now will stay in the supernatant, and anything larger than a chloroplast will be pelleting out. So you'll probably have a very, very small pellet this time compared with a larger one the first time, because what you're getting now is just some whole cells that managed to make it through the mirror plot. So then you're just going to pour your entire solution right here into another tube. And again, you're going to spin it 3,300 RPM for seven minutes. So this entire thing into another tube, spinning it down just like you had the first time. So now you're going to get all those chloroplasts pelleted down. So basically, in three spins, we have, th using differential centrifugation, We've separated our chloroplasts from anything larger. We've separated our chloroplasts from anything smaller. And we have purified just our chloroplasts. So when you do this, you're going to be bringing this up in two mils of STN buffer at this point. Remember to save a 0.2 mil sample um, of your chloroplasts in a separate 15 mil screw cap tube. You're going to need that sample saved for later analysis, so don't forget to do that. So then, after you've gotten to that point, we're now going to do osmotic shock. So you've resuspended your entire sample in two mils of STN buffer. I know the protocol says two to four mils, but you're just doing it in two mils, and you've saved a little bit of a sample. And you're going to measure your total volume. Now your total volume is not two mils. You've resuspended the pellet in two mils, but your total volume is going to be larger than two mils. Um, so you're going to measure your total volume, and then you are adding 10 volumes of water. So if you have, for example, four mils, you're going to be adding 40 mils of deionized water to this. So you're going to add the 40 mils of the deionized water at, to your chloroplast, to your purified chloroplast, and this is going to cause your chloroplasts 
to suck in all that water through osmotic shock, remember the protein purification lecture, and uh, as it sucks in all that water, it's going to cause the chloroplast to burst because it can't take it all. So the water wants to equalize the solute concentration inside and outside the membrane, but, but it can't. There's too much solute in the membrane, so it, it keeps getting larger and larger and larger until it bursts it open. Now here's the key thing. The chloroplasts, being a double-walled membrane, they will burst open. But the thylakoids are not a double-walled membrane. There's no solutes inside of the thylakoids. So the thylakoids are just these flat little stacked granular membranes. And so the, there, there's no place for water to go inside of the thylakoid membrane. So the thylakoids are going to remain intact while the chloroplast is actually first open. So, Again, after you, after you do this, so you're, going to add, you're going to add the water to it, you're going to spin it. Now, you're going to be spinning it much faster. So you're going to be spinning it at 12,000 RPM for 20 minutes. And you have to spin it at 12,000 RPM for 20 minutes because now it's much smaller. So you had chloroplasts, so you could pellet your chloroplasts at 3,300 RPM for 7 minutes because they were large. But now your, your thylakoids are much, much smaller. So now you're trying to pellet your thylakoids. And because they're much, much smaller, you need to use a greater amount of G-force and a greater amount of time. So 12,000 RPM in this, the rotor of, of choice that we're using. And uh, 20 minutes will pellet down your thylakoids. You're then going to resuspend your thylakoids in the same amount of buffer D, and buffer D just has a little bit of buffer and a little bit of, of magnesium just to keep everything stable now, now that we've already burst open the chloroplasts. Um, we we want to make sure that our pH doesn't get too off because if there's any residual proteases, we don't want them to be able to be active. So we're, we're restoring a little bit of buffer in there just for pH purposes. So you're bringing it up in, in buffer D and uh, then you're spinning it again just to make sure that you have purified out all of your thylakoids. So then at the, at the end of this, again, you're going to uh, resuspend it in, in total of two mils of buffer D. And again, you're gonna save a 0.2 mil sample after you have resuspended it in buffer D. We're gonna be taking those 0.2 mil samples to measure our chlorophyll amount in both of those to see how effective our separation was. So how we're going to use these 0.2 mil samples, we're going to be adding acetone to them. And acetone does four basic things. Acetone is solubilizing the membrane. It'll solubilize any membrane, chloroplast membrane, thylakoid membrane, it's solubilizing membrane. It's denaturing all the proteins. It'll denature photosystem one, it'll denature photosystem two, because those are sets of proteins, um, so that they are precipitating out. It's freeing chlorophyll A and B from those proteins, and it's a solvent for chlorophyll A and B, because chlorophyll A and B are hydrophobic. So, so by adding the acetone, basically we're getting the chlorophyll into solution and we're precipitating out the proteins, so we're getting rid of all of them, so we just have a pure solution of, of chlorophyll that's in our solution of acetone. So, then we're going to use known wavelength characteristics for chlorophyll A and B. And uh, there's actually uh, carotenoids also in there, Carotenoids will actually interfere with some of the wavelengths, some of the maximal wavelengths actually, for chlorophyll A and B. So we have to use very specific wavelengths to measure chlorophyll A and B that are not quite their maxima, but they have peaks in, the, in their area that, are, that do not interfere with, with the carotenoids, which actually interfere with the actual peaks of the chlorophyll A and B. So there's a formula that you're going to use. The total chlorophyll in micrograms per mil is equal to, and this is derived from Beer's Law, 8.02, which is kind of like part of an extinction coefficient, times the absorbance at 663, which is where chlorophyll A absorbs, 
plus 20.2 times the absorbance at 645, which is the peak for chlorophyll B. So remember this formula. You're going to be using this formula, and this is in micrograms per mil. So you are going to be adding acetone to your solution. So the procedure tells you to, um, to take your 0.2 mil sample and add 4.8 mils of 85% acetone. And right now, you have 0.2 mil sample in an aqueous solution, and you need to have at least 80% acetone to keep your chlorophyll in solution. So we're actually adding 85% acetone because if we simply added 80% acetone to aqueous sample, it would be below 80% acetone. So we're adding 4.8 mils of 85% acetone to keep it over 80% acetone. <coughs> so your 0.2 mil sample plus 4.8 mils. And you're just gonna vortex this for a little while. Normally, we don't vortex biological membranes, but in this case, the purpose of acetone is to completely uh, solubilize the membrane, so we're not worried about the, the intact nature of biological membranes. So you can vortex it. And then we're going to spin it in our, in our tabletop centrifuge to, to pellet out all of those proteins which are precipitating out. So you're gonna take, uh, then after you've spun it out and separated from the pellet, you're gonna take 500 microliters of the supernatant and you're gonna add it to 4.5 mils of 80% acetone. Okay. And um, this is a second dilution. Now the reason you have to do this second dilution is your absorbance is gonna to be too high for your spectrophotometer to actually uh, read. It'll be out of range. So doing the second dilution just means it will be in range. In your spectrophotometer, you're gonna blank with acetone and read at both wavelengths. So you can blank, uh, you can blank it and set it to 663 or 645, one of them first, blank with acetone, remove the acetone, put in your sample, take a reading, and then, and then do it again. You're gonna add the acetone to your plastic cuvette right before you need to use it because acetone uh, will destroy your cuvette within about five minutes. So you're not gonna blank it and then let it sit there for 20 minutes and expect your, your readings to be accurate in any way. You're gonna, you're gonna blank with acetone in a fresh cuvette, remove the acetone, add in your sample, read, get a new cuvette, read and redo the procedure. Cuvettes are like a penny a piece, so it's okay. So you've done these two dilutions. So your first dilution where you had 0.2 mils sample and 4.8 mils of acetone, you had a final volume of five mils, and you started with 0.2 mils, which means you've done a 25 times dilution. And, but then you did a second dilution, and that second dilution, you started with 0.5 mils of your first dilution, and um, when you had to, uh, the uh, 0.5 mils of your first dilution, you added 4.5 mils to that, so you still had a total volume of five mils, but you started off with 0.5 mils, so now you've only done a 10 times dilution. So between the two dilutions, you did a 25 times dilution and a 10 times dilution, so you have a total uh, dilution factor of 25 times 10, or 250 times. So when you get your numbers out of the spectrophotometer, you have to make sure that you multiply that number by 250 times to get the original concentration that you have. So, here's how you're gonna use those numbers and put them into a table. So let's say, and I will tell you, these numbers that I'm putting up here are completely bogus, just for the purposes of showing you how the math works. Do not expect numbers like these at all for your own experiment. So, Let's say you did your chloroplasts and you went through that dilution procedure and you read the 663 and you read the 645. And for 663 you got 1.2 and for 645 you got 1.3. And you put them into that formula and you said, okay, um, here's, my, here's my micrograms per mil, but wait, I have to multiply by 250 because I diluted it out twice. So if you did all that, your total chlorophyll and micrograms per mil after you had multiplied by 250, you would have 8,965 micrograms per mil. 
Let's say you have three mils, so you've measured your total volume at that point and have three mils. You're going to know what your total volume is because remember, you had to know it because you had to measure it to be able to add the appropriate amount of water to it. So you know your volume. So you have three mils of it. Well, this is 26,900 micrograms uh, total, which is, to put, it, to, to put it into an easier number to remember, 26.9 milligrams total of chlorophyll that you have isolated in your chloroplasts. You're going to do the same math for your thylakoids. A reading of you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, your total chlorophyll, 5140. Let's say you magically still managed to have three mils at the end of this. And so you have a total of 15.4 milligrams of, of chlorophyll in your thylakoids. Now your dilution factor has been 250 for both of them because you've, you've done that procedure twice. So you can calculate your yield. So your, your yield between the, the thylakoids and the chloroplasts, you, you ended up with 15.4 milligrams in your thylakoids. You have 26.9 from your chloroplasts. So your percent yield is 57.2%. In this class, I don't, I'm not judging you on your actual percent yield. I am judging you on your explanation of your results. So that's what I'm giving you points for, is the quality of how you explain what you did in the lab, what you could have done better, where you made your mistakes. So 57.2% uh, yield is fine. If you get an 80% yield, great. If you get over 100% yield, where did the extra chlorophyll come from? Did you, did you measure incorrectly someplace, you know, or, or if you lost a whole bunch, you know, think about, think about where it all went. So, you're using this table in your lab report to discuss the effectiveness of your procedure. So, so you're gonna lay out those numbers just like I laid them out for you a moment ago to be able to put it in a table format. Now, at the end of the first day, do not throw out your thylakoids, okay? You need to keep them for the second day. Specifically, you're going to dilute them to one mg per mil. So remember up there, you had calculated your concentration of your thylakoids. So you know that you have some fairly concentrated thylakoids. You need to dilute them down to one mg per mil with buffer D, and then we're gonna be using Triton to specifically separate photosystem one from photosystem two. We're going to be treating with Triton, which is a detergent, at a ratio of 2.5 to 1. So specifically, here's what you're going to do. Take this out. I've been editing your coughs, too. I'm sorry? I've been editing out your coughs, too. That's good. As much as I can. <laughs> okay, so lab calculations that you're going to do. To dilute your thylakoids to one mg per mil, let's say you have a concentration of 3.2 mg per mil after you've measured your thylakoids. Not your chloroplasts, your thylakoids. And let's say you have 5 mils of them. How much buffer D do you need to add to get one mg per mil? It's a basic dilution equation. So you have 3.2 mg per mil, you have five mils. You don't know uh, what the total volume needs to be, but you know it needs to be one mg per mil. So when you solve for X, X is gonna equal 16 mils. Do not add 16 mils to your five mils already. That will give you less than one mg per mil. And if you have less than one mg per mil of thylakoids when you measure them, you can either adjust the amount of Tritonex 100 that you're going to add, or you can simply re-spin and bring up in a smaller volume. Either way will work. So if you have, uh, if you have five mils already and you need 16 mils total, you would add 11 mils of buffer D to get it to one mg per mil. So after you have one mg per mil of, uh, of your thylakoids, you need to add triton. Specifically, um, you, need to fit, you need to calculate the amount of triton that's required to obtain a ratio of 2.5 milligrams triton per milligram of chlorophyll if you are treating two mils 
of one mg per mil. So if you read your protocol, it tells you to take uh, two mils of your, of your thylakoids that you have diluted to one mg per mil and add an appropriate amount of triton. Now your triton is 25% weight volume. So if you remember the biochem boot camp lectures, 25% weight volume, if you're simply changing units on that from 100 mils volume to one mil, that would be 0.25 grams per mil or 250 milligrams per mil. So, so having some uh, uh, functionality with the metric system is essential in this class. So you have uh, you're treating two mils of your one mg per mil thylakoids. So you have two milligrams of your chlorophyll in your thylakoids. And the, the uh, lab manual tells you that you need a ratio of 2.5 milligrams of triton per milligram of chlorophyll. <coughs> and you have those two milligrams of the, of the thylakoids, which means you need five milligrams of triton. So you need a total of five milligrams of triton. How are you gonna get that? Well, five milligrams of triton, if, you're, if your triton X100 is 250 milligrams per mil, that means you need 0 0.02 mils or 20 microliters of triton X100 added to your two mils of your, of your solution. So here's what's gonna happen when you add that triton. So if you have added triton, if you add too much triton, so let's say you added a 10 to one ratio. Remember the protocol tells you to add a 2.5 to one ratio. But let's say you accidentally add too much triton. So if you added a 10 to one ratio, you're gonna solubilize everything. You're gonna break it up into small micellar particles. So you're gonna, you're gonna take your photosystem one, which is normally a group of proteins which is peripherally attached, and your photosystem two, which is a group of proteins which is integral to the membrane, and instead of being able to just solubilize your photosystem one away from the photosystem two, which would remain in the membrane, if you have too much triton, you blow all of your proteins apart. You blow your membrane apart, you blow apart your proteins, and you get, you get small particles, and you get tiny, tiny little particles all coated in detergent. If you add the correct amount, the 2.5 to one ratio of the triton, you're gonna disrupt the protein membrane interaction and free just your peripherally attached proteins, which is your photosystem one, and your photosystem two will still remain in the thylakoid membrane, still remain integral to that thylakoid membrane. So in this case, you would have your thylakoid membranes, which would still be basically the same size, <coughs> and your peripherally attached proteins. So when you do a rate zonal centrifugation with those, and remember, a rate zonal centrifugation, it's using, it's separating by size, but it's using a density gradient to be able to stabilize your, your solution, make it a little harder for everything to go through. If you did not have uh, a sucrose density gradient, you just tried to, to put it, say, in you know, some regular buffer, they would fly th through far too fast. So, so using a, a sucrose gradient uh, will stabilize and will slow everything down so that you can get good separation. So you're, you're gonna be comparing an untreated sample with a sample that's been treated with Triton X100. And so your untreated sample, you're gonna spin for a certain amount of time, and at the end of that time, you're basically going to have a band in your gradient. And if it's your control that has not been treated with Triton, you still have your photosystem one, your photosystem two, and it's still in the membrane, and that's where it's going to move to in the gradient. On the other hand, if you add a 2.5 to 1 ratio of triton, your photosystem 1 separates, and your photosystem 1 is much, much smaller than the photosystem 2 in the thylakoid membrane. So it's going to be at the very top of your gradient compared with the photosystem 2 um, and, and in the membrane, which still is going to move at a 
approximately the same position because even freeing up photosystem one does not change the size of it that much because thylakoids are much, much larger than the, the number of proteins which make up photosystem one. So it'll be approximately the same place in your gradient. If you add too much triton, you're going to blow everything apart and you're going to see everything up here. All my cells, all very, very small particles, and uh, so like a 10 to 1 ratio of triton uh, just says you've added far too much triton. If you don't add enough triton, if you measure incorrectly and don't add enough, you're not going to have enough detergent to separate your photosystem 1 from your photosystem 2, and it will look very much like your control sample, so you will not really see much of anything at the top of, of the gradient. So that is 